Hi, and welcome, today's video comes from Houston, home of the Rockets, and of course NASA. Houston, we have a problem. We're looking into the story of the Whitaker family, who live in the lovely sounding Sugarland. By all accounts, the Whitakers were the perfect family, they lived in the wealthy community of Sugarland, just outside Houston, in Texas. Frank and Trisha Whitaker were the parents of two boys, Bart, 22, and his younger brother Kevin, who was 19. Frank was an accountant for a large construction company, and his wife Trisha gave up her career as an elementary school teacher to become a stay-at-home mother for Kevin and Bart. Bart and Kevin were very close as brothers, Kevin, being a second-year college student, looked up to his older brother, who was graduating from Sam Houston State University, with honors. The pair also had a great relationship with their parents, often taking long-distance bike rides with their father. The family also went on vacation to places like Cancun, Mexico, and skiing holidays. They were quite an affluent family and had bought the boys several luxury vehicles and had even bought Bart a lakeside townhouse in Willis, Texas. It was time to celebrate on the 10th of December 2003, as Bart had an announcement to make to his family, he had finished his final exams at Sam Houston State University that week, and he would be graduating with honors. His parents and brother couldn't be happier for Bart, who had been putting a lot of work into his education, and to honor his achievement, they presented him with a $4,000 Rolex watch. That night, they decided to go and celebrate at a popular restaurant called Papader in Stafford. The family celebrated in style, telling Bart how proud they were, also taking photos of the joyous occasion. The Whitakers finished their seafood meals and decided to go back to the house to continue the celebrations when they returned. They drove the short journey home. When they arrived back on their driveway, Bart went to his other car to pick up his cell phone, the others went into the house. Kevin was the first into the house, followed by Trisha, they were both immediately shot by a masked intruder. Kent heard the gunshots and got to the doorway, where he was also shot. By this time, Bart heard all the gunshots and came running to the aid of his family. He was shot in the arm as he wrestled the gunman, who then fled the scene out the back of the house. Kevin and Trisha were both shot in the chest, Kevin was killed instantly, Trisha would die later in hospital. Kent was shot in the shoulder and Bart in the arm. Both would survive the attack, although the bullet shattered Kent's humerus and his heart was only missed by inches. Kent later recalled that when he seen the masked intruder, he thought it was one of his kid's friends playing a prank with a paintball gun. Concerned neighbor, Cliff Rios, who heard all the commotion, dialed 911 and raced to the scene, he even took off his t-shirt to press it on the gunshot wound and stop the bleeding. 911. Someone has just shot our neighbor. Who's been shot? Uh, Trisha and Kit. Who shot them? Uh, we don't know someone in the mask. What kind of injuries do they have? I, I don't know. They just been shot. Hang on just a second. We've got them calling on another line. Sherlyn 911, station emergency. <laughs> I've been shot. Who's been shot? Uh, it's my mom and my dad and my brother. Hold on one second, sir. Engine 1, all we have one subject right now. Is apparently the whole family's been shot. Uh, Stand by. Is this Trisha or Kent? This is Bart, the son. Okay, Bart, where, where is your wound? In the arm, my shoulder. I think I can't leave my arm. Okay, who else has been shot in the house with you? Oh, I can't see. Who else was in the house with you? We were walking in the house. My brother and my mom and my dad. Oh, God, I can't. I, I need you to hang on, Bart. I've got help on the way, okay? Do you know who shot you? No. Okay, your neighbors were telling me that he had a mask on. Is that true? No. I think it's dark in here. Okay, do you think he was burglarizing your home, or are you guys having problems with somebody? Oh, no. God, I don't know. How many? How many shots did he fire, Bart? I don't know. Can you tell me anything about him at all? Did he sound black, white, Hispanic, Middle Eastern? No, you're black. I don't know. I, I couldn't. Uh, oh. Okay, when he left, Bart, did he leave out your back door? Yeah, I chased him that way. He let you chase him out towards the back door? Yeah. Okay, Bart, where were you when he shot you? Uh, in the living room. Oh. 
slow down, okay? They're, they're on the way. Where are you in the house right now? I'm in the living room. You're in the living room? Or, oh, someone's here. Okay, do you see the officers uh, bark? Yeah. Okay, that's the officers coming in. I'm going to go ahead and disconnect with you, okay? Okay. Thank you. Detective Marshall Slot, who was the lead investigator for the murders, thought Control were joking when they told him there was a four-person shooting in Sugarland. That is how little crime occurs in that area. When Slot arrived at the Whitaker residence, his first impression was that it was a burglary gone wrong. But as he checked through the house, he realized that some things just weren't adding up. Normally, a burglar would tip the drawers out and make a complete mess, rifling through everything. But all of the drawers were open to the same distance, none had been tipped out, and when he asked what valuable items were missing, there didn't seem to be any. No jewelry, no electronics, nothing. It just didn't sit right with him. In fact, the only thing that was taken was the murder weapon. The family's gun safe was pried open, and a handgun that was registered to Kevin was used to shoot the family, but whoever had done this must have had prior knowledge of the location of the gun safe, as it was in an isolated part of the house, and you just wouldn't stumble upon it. Police thought they had a break when another house in the neighborhood had an armed robbery, but the cases were not linked, and that was quickly ruled out. Detective Slot continued to routinely question the witnesses to the crime, and Bart told him that he was about to graduate from Sam Houston State University. But, the day after speaking to Bart, Slot got information from a news media source, informing him that Bart wasn't graduating at all, he wasn't even a student there. This made Detective Slot wonder. What else was he lying about? After checking his criminal record, all police could find was a burglary charge. Bart had broke into a school and stole some computers, but there was nothing violent on his record. Then, five days after the shootings, Detective Slot got a lead. An old friend of Bart's, Adam Hip, told him that two years prior to the shooting, Bart had tried to hire him to kill his parents. He even replicated a drawing that Bart had given him as to where the shooter would stand and in which room the shootings would take place. Adam was considered a suspect, but he had an airtight alibi for the night of the shootings, and why would he implicate himself if he was involved? Bart was now top of the suspect list, but he denied any involvement in the shooting. He promised his father that he had nothing to do with it, and that he loved his parents and Kevin. With nothing linking Bart to the shooting, police started to look at his closest friends, who were Chris Brashear and Stephen Champagne. They worked with Bart at the Bentwater Yacht and Country Club, near Lake Conroe. Brashear and Champagne both denied any involvement and provided police with DNA and sent test samples. No matches were made on Champagne, but sniffer dogs indicated that Brashear's smell was on the set of drawers that were left open, and also, the murder weapon. Police had their number one suspect. Both Brashear's and Champagne's phones were tapped, with the hopes they would incriminate themselves, but they wouldn't talk about the crime over the phone. Police would follow the pair and make it clear to them that they were being followed in an attempt to unnerve them. Detectives also directed Adam Hip to contact Bart and get him to admit that he once tried to have his family murdered, but Bart didn't say anything incriminating. But in another telephone conversation, detectives would hear Bart offer Adam $20,000 to keep quiet. Bart must have felt the net closing in by this point, and seven months after the shootings, he left the house, telling his dad that he was going to a club, and simply vanished. Nobody knew where Bart went, but detectives knew he wouldn't be coming back in a hurry. Police focused on the other two suspects, Champagne and Brashear. They continued following them until finally Champagne cracked. He told officers that he was involved in the crime, but only as a getaway driver, and Brashear was the one who went into the house and shot the family. He also said that the whole thing was Bart's idea. He went on to explain 
that he went and watched the family celebrate Bart's graduation at the Papadur restaurant, then called Brashir when the family had left. Brashir was already in the Whitaker home, with the key and alarm code, provided by Bart. Bart had promised the two of them a share of the $1.5 million that he would inherit from his family's murders. Champagne then led officers to a bridge over Lake Conroe, where he had thrown a bag of evidence into the lake. Divers were called and soon recovered it. Inside, they found a chisel, two cell phones, and ammunition. They all linked to the crime scene. There was also a water bottle, which had Brashier's DNA on it. After almost two years, Brashier and Champagne were arrested and charged in connection with the shooting. Had Bart gotten away with murder? Bart stole $10,000 from his dad and fled to Mexico with the help of his friend Rudy Rios. Bart had bought Rudy's identity from him and settled in the town of Saralvo, and although he could speak very little Spanish, he soon found a girlfriend and got a job at a furniture store owned by her family. He would tell people that he had no family as his mother was a drug addict prostitute and that he got his bullet wound in his arm whilst serving in Afghanistan. He said that his squad was attacked by the Taliban and that he killed one, then another shot him in the arm. Bart lived happily in Mexico with his new identity and life, but it wasn't going to last for long. Bart's so-called friend and real owner of his fake identity, Rudy Rios, had heard about a $10,000 reward for information on where Bart was hiding. Rudy decided that money was more important than friendship. Speaking to detectives, Rudy told them he escorted Bart to Mexico and then sold him his identity for $3,000. Then told them, if there's a reward, I don't care, I'll turn his ass in. What a loyal friend. Bart was arrested by Mexican authorities and quickly brought back to the US. Detective Slot was waiting for him at the border. Also waiting for him were county prosecutors Jeff Strange and Fred Falkman. In October 2005, a grand jury indicted Bart Whitaker, Steve Champagne, and Chris Brashear for the murders of Trisha and Kevin Whitaker. In 2007, Chris Brashear pleaded guilty to the murders and received a life sentence, with the possibility of parole after 30 years, it will be 2035, and he will be 53 years old. After not taking part in the actual murders and agreeing to testify against the others, Champagne was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. At Bart's trial, prosecutors told the jury how after the shooting, Bart told Champagne that they would have to finish the job off and really kill his dad next time. Prosecutors also uncovered another plan by Bart to murder his parents in the year 2000. His two roommates, Will Anthony and Justin Peters, were to break into his parents' house and shoot them. But as they tried to break into the house, the alarm sounded and they both fled the scene. Another college friend of Bart's Jennifer Jaffert heard about the plan to kill his family and informed police. Police immediately went to see Bart and his parents. Bart told his parents it was a big misunderstanding and they believed him. Maybe they should have took the threat a little more seriously. On the 8th of March, 2007, after deliberating for just a few hours, Bart was found guilty of murdering his mother, his brother, and the attempted murder of his father. Kent Whitaker and Trisha Whitaker's brother spoke up at the trial and pleaded that Bart be spared the death penalty. Bart had admitted his guilt and expressed remorse for the murders he orchestrated. But after deliberating for 10 hours, the jurors came back with the decision that Bart must be put to death for his actions. Bart was to be executed by lethal injection. Kent Whitaker believed Bart had reformed and openly forgave him and the gunman, Chris Brashear. Kent has fought tirelessly for over a decade for Bart's death sentence to be reduced to life imprisonment, stating that Bart was the last remaining member of his immediate family.
you begged the DA not to push for the death penalty, begged the DA. They didn't listen. No. Did they ever explain to you why? Why the, the surviving victim's desires? And, and your wife's family wasn't in support of the death penalty no. either. Why it mattered so little? I don't know. Uh, every victim in this, in this uh, awful, awful crime, uh, Trisha's family, my family, my parents, uh, everybody, we pleaded with the district attorney for a year and a half to accept two back-to-back 40-year -back life sentences. Um, and um, at one point, I met with the assistant DA who prosecuted the case, and uh, he, at, after an hour's discussion about it, uh, he said, so, Mr. Whitaker, are you asking me not to pursue the death penalty in this case? And I wanted him to know just how important it was to me. So I got out of my chair. I actually got down on the floor on my knees, and I said, no, I'm begging you not to pursue the death penalty. Kent's fight seemed hopeless when all appeals were exhausted and his execution was set for 6 p.m. on the 22nd February. 2018. Seven days before his son was due to be executed, Kent made one last desperate plea for mercy to the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles. Two days before his execution time, the board makes a recommendation for clemency, but the decision is in the hands of the state governor. On the day of the execution, Bart had eaten his final meal and was getting ready to be strapped to the execution table when news came in that his death sentence has been reduced to life imprisonment without parole. That was close. Still, I bet it's the best meal he's had in ages. Tonight, a Sugarland father says his prayers were answered after years of working to save his son from death row finally pays off. Bart Whitaker was just 40 minutes from being executed tonight for the deaths of his mother and brother before Governor Abbott stepped in. Grace White is here with why the governor made this very rare decision. Grace? The governor cited three reasons for his decision. First, Bart Whitaker will never be released. Second, the actual shooter in this case didn't get the death penalty. He got life in prison. And finally, Whitaker's father. He said he would be victimized again if the state executed his son. It was, it was, it was overpowering. An emotional father standing in front of the building where his son was to be put to death. We uh, touched hands through the glass and uh, we said our goodbyes. Kent Whitaker visited his son Bart, not knowing if this meeting would be their last. This has been such an emotional thing. Then 40 minutes before the execution came a proclamation from the governor. He said, quote, the role of the governor is not to second guess the court process or reevaluate the law and the evidence. Instead, to consider the unanimous vote for life in prison from the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles. A TDCJ spokesman shared Bart Whitaker's response. I deserved any punishment for my crimes, but my dad did nothing wrong. The system worked for him today, and I will do my best to uphold my end of the bargain. Kent has since remarried to Tanya. Kent continues to visit his son in prison and will continue to do so. Chris Brashear will stay in jail until 2035, and Stephen Champagne is due for release in 2022. Thanks for watching, I really appreciate it. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to see more videos like this.